And I just wanted to thank everyone for coming. My name is Kirsten Kerr, and I am a school teacher librarian in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And I teach high school, but for 10 years, uh, or I'm sorry, I've taught high school for, for the past 10 years. And then for the previous four years before that, I was the librarian at an elementary school. So I have a little bit of experience with all age groups in K through 12. I haven't, I haven't taught at a middle school yet, but, um, uh, but I also have four children. So, um, so I have been teaching research skills for a long time. And I had kind of mentioned to everybody before that um, it's going to be an interesting, we're going to, it's going to be a, a little bit of a whirlwind. This was a hard one for me to plan for because teaching research skills can be a huge job. And really, it should be um, embedded into the curriculum. So, um, so, but, so, but I have uh, uh, lots of resources and lots of things that I want to share with you. So, but first I want to just have you in the chat, tell me where you're all from and if you, where, what kind of a library you work at, or if you're a student or just give me a quick chat on where you're from and what state you're from. And if you're a school librarian or a public librarian, I know we have a couple um, state agency librarians out there. There we go. Anybody? Oh, there we go. All right. Thanks, David. Wonderful. Hi, Jen. Julia, thank you. Misty, thank you. Awesome. Jeannie's here from Boise. We have a lot of uh, Idaho people, which is awesome. Uh, part of my slides will include using our, our state library databases, which is called lily.org. So um, when we get there, I'll explain that a little bit more. So um, I want to let you know a couple housekeeping things. Uh, I don't have, oh, and Ketchum, great, thank you. So glad to have you. Um, I don't have a moderator for this. And so this is the third webinar that I've done for Emporia, which has been super fun for me. I've loved doing them. But I have noticed that having a moderator is helpful just so that someone can stay up with those chats. So I thought I would just explain to everyone up front that I will check the chats in between each slide. So if you have questions, you're welcome to either just unmute yourself and ask or if you put it over in the chat, I'll try to address those in between slides. So um, I uh, introduced myself, my name is Kirsten Kerr. And so um, our learning objective for today is to discuss ideas for teaching research skills to K through 12 students in, in schools. And I also will provide for you resources for you to use with your staff and students. And so down here is, um, our my the address to my Google site, and that has the resources that you can download. And so I will put those in the chat. In fact, I'll do that right now. Let me go over here and copy that. I should have copied that before. I apologize. And I will put it in the chat for you to get to. And then you'll have them so we don't get to the end and forget because we could end up running out of time. So it'll force you to make a copy and then into the chat. Sorry guys. Where's my chat? I lost it. When I, uh, all right, when I uh, changed my screen, I lost my chats. Okay, I'm going to keep going and then I'll find them as we go. Oh, there we go. Hold on. Sorry about that, you guys. So paste. 
Okay, so that's where you will find all the resources. And if you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint, I'm happy to share that with you as well. So just let me know. Um, my email will also be um, on the website that I send you to for my resources. And then you can email me for the slides. So we are um, just gonna talk about some basic chunks of how to organize research. And this is really something that should be embedded in the curriculum, but these are kind of the basic parts. We wanna, for me, the thing that I tend to spend the most time on is finding valid, unbiased, factual information. Uh, I think it's really important to stay organized, to understand their topic and what questions should be answered and use efficient search strategies. And then of course, cite their sources. So we're gonna talk a little bit about each of these categories. And um, it's really important that students know that research is a process. It's not something that th just like this webinar is hard for me to do in one hour to go over everything that you would wanna take into consideration and all the things that we hope our students will learn and know. Um, it should really be something that they incorporate into their whole life. But a research paper is definitely something where they need to spend some time and they need to think about their topic and they need to understand what it is they're researching. So um, I always try to start with letting the kids know that so they know they're not just gonna go onto Google, find four sites and call it good. So, um, so how do students find information? They're used to searching and they're used to finding things really quickly. And they're used to taking pretty much the first thing they find and using that to help guide their opinion. And so they tend to use social media. They tend to use the internet, Instagram, uh, not so much Facebook, that's more us, but when they get into college, they're back to Facebook, Snapchat, lots of blogs, lots of um, lots of uh, influence from their family and their culture as well. So it tends to be these external sources and that can cause them to form opinions before they've ever even done their research. So that's something that we're trying to help our, our students learn. So, um, the first thing that I try to talk to them about when I am teaching research skills for either elementary, all everything that we're going to talk about today can be used for elementary, middle school or high school. And the very first thing that I usually cover, because I think it's probably one of the biggest issues that our students have and and deal with is inaccurate information, the so called fake news and then bias and opinions. So I probably won't open every single resource that uh, that I that I am showing you, but I will show you a few. And this one here is something that I've used with older studies with older students, and it's a case study by the New York Times on how fake news goes viral. So I won't share everything, but it talks about the timeline and an actual situation where somebody posted a picture, made an assumption, and how fast and how quickly that, how fast and quickly that spread and how it went viral and the timeline on it. So when I talk to show the kids this, I feel like it helps them to see that it's true and sees the process of how this information is shared and then how at the end, he ended up deleting his whole post and saying that he wished he hadn't shared it and that he realizes that he didn't really know what he was doing. So, so it's actually kind of an interesting resource to share with kids if you were trying to show them um, how the internet is spreading misinformation. I have um, quite a few other uh, sources that I like to use in classes. So all of these will also be on that resource. And I won't go through all of them. And some of them you probably know, and a lot of them you probably don't. But I do feel like the more we can actually pull things up and show kids, the better they will understand why we have to use better sources. So you all probably have seen the tree octopus. If you haven't, this is a classic source that you should definitely show your students, especially younger kids. But I have to tell you, I have high school kids who still struggle to, to, to think through whether this might be a real animal or not. So it's a really well-made website that shows um, uh, 
that shows a, an octopus. My favorite is the sightings where it shows the octopus crawling up the tree. And of, of course, completely false, but everything that we tell the students to look for is pretty, it is there, it has a, but if they take the time to do what we ask them to, which is find another source that will um, corroborate the evidence and then also um, look at um, who the author is and where they're from and what their credentials are. If we do that, then they will, they will get a better understanding of the fact that this was created just for students to um, learn that some things on the internet are not true. So if you haven't used this, I encourage you to use it. Uh, the other one, I won't show you all of them. There's one called Dog Island. And, um, but the best part about some of these, uh, I'll show you Dog Island first, because when you go to about, so we always teach our kids not just to look at the information, but also to look at um, FAQs and who are, who are we? So if I go to FAQs, let's see. Um, or I think it was down at about that I found it. Uh, it says, um, here's our disclaimer. So this is where, when I was looking to say, how would students actually figure this out? The disclaimer is hilarious because it says this site was made in jest for fun, and for fun, for love of dogs and for love of life. You are to take no actions, make no decisions based on the content of this website. It goes on and on. It is actually hilarious. You can't blame us for anything. You can't be mad at us for anything. The only point for you on this website is to enjoy yourself. So they make that disclaimer if the kids take the time to go and explore it. And, and that is the, the case for almost everything. Um, this one, All About Explorers, is pretty good for elementary students because it's kind of part fact and part fiction but when you go to four teachers it explains why this this website was developed and what what they're hope what they're hoping that the kids will learn and some lessons on just because it's out there doesn't mean it's good so these are all great websites for you to use as examples of why you can't just pull a source up on google or the internet and then take it for fact um, I'm going to point out DHMO uh, because I do want to, I just want to check my time. Um, this one I use at the high school level a lot as well. And so this one is a great example of how a website can show bias. So this is about dihydrogen monoxide. And most kids, usually in a class of students that are even 11th or 12th grade, maybe one or two students will know what dhmo.org is. And so, um, Everything is pretty much factual. I like to go to what is dihydrogen monoxide and um, it's an invisible killer. It should be banned. Find out the truth about dihydrogen monoxide. Thousands die each year after inhaling it. It's a major component of acid rain. Um, it, it's linked to gun violence. That, that is a little bit, um, uh, uh, I think that it's a that that is a definitely an attention grabber. Um, I'm not crazy about it, but that is another good reason to let the kids see this because dihydrogen dihydrogen monoxide is really just water, and so everything that you're reading about this actually is true. Thousands do die each year after inhaling it because they drown, and it has been found in our liver or rivers, lakes, oceans, and streams. And it is used by athletes to enhance their performance. And so at first glance, it, you would think that it's some sort of an acid or some sort of a performance enhancing drug or something. And so this is a great way to explain to kids what bias means and how someone can take factual information, but then um, present it in a way that will make you think what they want you to think. So I am a big fan of using DHMO. Um, Wikipedia, we talk a lot about Wikipedia. And this was actually fun because I always show Wikipedia and we always talk about whether it's a good source or whether it's a, a reliable source or not a reliable source. And most of the kids now think that it's not, but only because their teacher has told them that it's not, they don't really understand. And so I try to explain to them that a wiki is really was created for lots of people to collaborate on one document and share information. 
And so this is actually, I um, when I open this up, this is what it would be. And this is actually a Wikipedia article on whether Wikipedia is a reliable source or not. I've never found that before. And so this is probably what I'll start using. And so this talks a little bit about it, but what I also show the kids, and you can do this on any Wikipedia site, I go to view history. And on view history, you can see exactly when it was changed and by whom. So Dino Sauce 2001 made a comment and changed 14 things on this on February 17th, 2021. So this shows you how recently this article was changed and how many times. And usually when you look at the names, um, they're used not often. Oh, this one was interesting. The man who ran outside naked changed it. And so when these kids see this, it gives them a better understanding on if I were to cite Wikipedia as a source on November 15th, and then on November 16th, Dan Block came in and changed the source and changed Wikipedia, the numbers or the stats or the information that I cited might not be there. Somebody might have changed it by the time the teacher or someone goes to see what they are citing. And so that is a great explanation of why Wikipedia is a great place to start. In fact, the article even says this. It's a great it's a great springboard to get some information, basic broad information about a topic, but it can't be used as an academic source because it's not consistent and we don't really know the credentials of the people who are changing things. So that's another source that I use, and I've never found this one that's Wikipedia, and so I, I will probably start using that in my classes. And then finally, um, I'm going to show you this one, and this is Kathy Schrock's guide. So Kathy Schrock is a very um, well-known librarian. You probably all know her, and she is amazing. And so this is all kinds of information on critical evaluation of websites. And so um, she's also really good about keeping her information updated. And so, um, so you can go here, and then when you go back to home, she has information on all kinds of things. I have another source of hers that I'm using. So um, I encourage you to take a look at that source as well for um, when you're creating or when you're presenting or teaching a lesson on, um, on evaluating sources. So I've got some more resources for you, and I don't know that I'll go through all of them, but often um, there's an image out there that is um, a pretty good, in fact, let me see if it's on this one, teaching strategies of um, using uh, students, turning stu students into fact-finding web detectives. Let's close this. And um, there's a lot of resources here, but there's one, and. Um, so you can download everything. This is common sense education. So uh, everything is copyright okay for you to use. Um, but there's a picture and it's a picture of daisies that grow funny. And somebody put on there that it had been, um, that those daisies had grown near a power plant that had exploded, a nuclear power plant. And so, so but if you do a reverse image search of the photograph, then it takes you back to where the photo was, was originally posted and you can follow the trail backwards. And so I think that's a really handy tool for students. I also found this guy while I was doing research for this webinar and um, seven non-scholarly sources you should never reference. And he is a, 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 a university professor. And I thought that it was just, what I liked about this source, especially for students is that he speaks in student language and it's not academic and it gets it just gets right to the point of why different things would be credible and why things wouldn't be credible so another resource for you to use if you are interested so let me um so then there oops there's the crap test and the crap test there's a lot of information on that there's um some youtube videos that i've shared and um, let's see, and this is just a handout that um, for a, a organizer for rating something. And then there is a, a quick YouTube video, I think I said that already, that, um, that 
goes through how you use it. And I think this, and then there's a, also an overview of a lesson. So um, there are um, some great uh, handouts too that just show um, what CRAP stands for. And so um, you'll find all that in my resources. And that's a, a pretty, uh, popular method of teaching students, especially younger kids, how to evaluate um, how to evaluate information and how to evaluate whether a resource is good or bad. So um, so there you go. I also included this and this uh, is in the resources and this is just a quick a quick infograph uh, from EasyBib that shows how to, uh evaluate a news article and so i thought this was a great visual it's from easybib.com and i i included the the uh link for you to go there and easybib does have some really good information on citing sources and on using um on using citation machines and and also on evaluating information so it looks like we do have um some notes over here so i'm going to go over here and so somebody said all slides for schools is a very helpful site that gives at no cost educators tools, resources, information and curricular guidance to help students build skills in news literacy, bias awareness, critical thinking and conversation. That's awesome. I will make sure that I explore that. Thank you, Christy. I love when I can meet with other educators so we can share resources. So thank you for sharing that. And then Kathy says, I would really like the PowerPoint. So I will be happy to give you this PowerPoint, Kathy. Um, I will, in fact, how about if I just post the PowerPoint on that same um, website that I gave you the link for, just give me a few minutes after this webinar is over and I'll post it so that you can make a copy of this, okay? So I will, let's see, did I get everything? I think that's everything for now on the chat. You're welcome. All right, so so these are just all some things that you could use with different age groups and um, and just to kind of visually show them what what we would what we're looking for when we evaluate a website or a piece of information. And so I usually tell kids, you know, I use Google 100 times a day to get directions somewhere to find a recipe to figure out where what time something's open but when it comes to writing a an academic research paper we want them to use academic sources and so this is when i would yes i will thank you sarah i will post the recording sorry i said i wouldn't look at the chats and i got distracted <laughs> so um so i this is why i want our children to use academic sources and so what this is sort of my lead into what what and why we want to teach them to use sources that maybe aren't quite as easy to get the information from a little more steps a little more evaluating but much better information so when i search for google when i search google for assisted suicide i get five million results when i search explora for assisted suicide which is an ebsco database i get fourteen thousand. 28 results. So less results, but better results. And so this is what I usually do is I will do a Google search and then I will take them into our um, Lily, which I want to talk about next. And so um, some of I'll, I'll, we'll talk about academic sites here in just a second, but um, some great places to get sources. Um, other great places to get information, other great sources. Sorry, I, I think that that's a typo on my, my um, PowerPoint, which I will fix. Um, school and public library collections. I feel like we often forget about our own collections and our public library collections. And everything is so accessible virtually now. And almost every library that, libraries are helpful. That's what we're here to do. So we, if I call my public library and say, can I borrow this book for a student, we make a, we figure it out. We get them a library card. I will go pick it up. They will drop it off. We have a really good uh, 
connection. And I hope that you all will, will create a good connection with your public libraries because all we wanna do is get good sources in students' hands. So I sometimes forget. And so I have been really good lately about making sure that when students are looking for something, we always check our library collections first. I buy um, whenever I can get grants or, um, uh, fundraisers or that sort of thing. I try to buy some nonfiction books that are unbiased, that are pretty easy to read, even for my high school students, that just have basic information on lots of different, usually controversial subjects, such as assisted suicide, so that I can give them a hard copy book to use. Because sometimes I feel like, A, they'll have an easier time visually getting the information from that book. And B, I want them to see that libraries have lots of information if you just come in and ask. So don't forget about your school and your public library collections. Encyclopedias are an amazing resource and most encyclopedias now are virtual or electronic. And so I always show my kids encyclopedias and encourage them to use them. And Google Scholar is a really great place. It's Google Scholar is a little harder to navigate, um, but it's got really good information and, and you can trust it. And it's also a great place to go down to the bibliography and see what other sources, if you're on a topic that you're having a hard time finding information on. And finally, I discovered just um, while doing the research for this webinar, science.gov. I, I came across that, that source on lots of academic library websites and, and um, guides uh, that libraries post. And we were talking about it, um, Mike and I, Mike uh, and I were talking before the webinar started. He was actually um, the one who, who said that that we're it's getting harder to teach students the difference between fact and opinion and I had him look at um, dhmo.org and he was saying that he felt like that website looked like it was a little outdated well when I go to science.gov I feel like this website looks like it's a little bit outdated also however it has a lot of information from a lot of uh, government agencies so um so it's another good place and someplace that um, especially older students might find helpful for finding information for STEM and, and that sort of thing. So we have, um, we have something called Lily and lily.org is a website that, in fact, I'll open it real quick. Lily.org, sorry, we're moving a little slow. Um, our state agency, which is called the Idaho Commission for Libraries, offers Lily to all residents in the state of Idaho at no cost. And so some schools are lucky enough to have access to subscription databases. We, our school district does not have the budget for that. And so we try very hard to steer our students to Lily because uh, it's something that not only can they use while they're here in school, but they can also use it once they graduate. And I usually use the Chilton. If you go down here and you scroll through some of our more popular databases, Chilton Library, that one gets a lot of kids attention just while I'm in class for their English classes that, and um, showing them that they can, they have access to this because these Chilton books are 30, 40, $50 each. And this database is offered to our residents at no charge. Most states have some sort of collection of databases that they offer their, um, their residents. And I really encourage you, if you are a school librarian, to reach out and find out what is available to you in your state so that you can have access to this great information. And so when I look here, here's my world book for students. And it's an, a great um, encyclopedia. And then there's the world book kids, which is for younger students. And there's Explora, which is what I usually direct our students to because it's got a lot of different levels of information. And then finally, Academic Search Premier is a little bit higher level, but peer reviewed information. So I hope that you will make sure you reach out to your state agencies to see what 
um, resources you have access to. I was told, and I'm not, please do not quote me on this, but I was told it's several million dollars worth of subscription databases that are offered to every resident in our state. So I'm hoping our students will remember, will use them in college, and then also use them just in life because there's lots of good information here. Lots of SAT prep and AP prep classes and that sort of thing. So um, so these are all places. So we, we try to talk about if we, you know, how to evaluate that information. And then after you've evaluated, where can you go to get good information? Where can you go to make your research a little bit easier? So um, I am a huge advocate for teaching students early how to stay organized. We are a, a Google for Education school district. So we use Google. If you are a Microsoft school, the same principles apply. So I encourage our kids to um, get organized right at the beginning of their high school career. And hopefully we can say middle school and elementary school students start getting organized now, especially for students who use Drive because it's easy for that to get out of control. Um, when I teach my seniors this, who for whatever reason haven't gotten it from me, I've, I'm very lucky. I get to work with all of my English classes when they do their first research paper or almost all of them. So that not only lets the kids get to know me as the librarian so they can come see me for whatever they need, but it also gives me a chance to sort of embed some of these um, principles into their learning throughout their four years at my high school. And so my seniors say, I wish I would have known this earlier because it um, staying organized is, a, and it's so easy. They just, they just have, some of them just don't know how to do it. So this is just a little um, screenshot of how to save a full text copy of something to Google Drive. So what I usually have them do is I have them start by creating, going into their drive and I do this with them and I walk them through it. And I go in and say, okay, create one folder in your drive or, or in your, you know, your drive on your school computer or however you guys use, however you use your information at your school districts. And so create a folder and then go back to wherever it is that you are going to, well, actually what I have them do, let me back up. I have them create a folder and then I have them create a file inside the folder. And this is my chance to remind them to please name your documents because I often have to help kids search for documents or research or assignments. And they have about four or 500 untitled documents in their drive. And it's very hard to search for those when they forget to name everything. So I, help, I encourage them to start naming all their documents and using file folders. And so they create a folder for their 10th grade research project. And then inside that folder, they create a document and we call that re research notes. And so I just have them start there. And then I, from there, I, I'm gonna go ahead and admit this person. Um, so then once they create their folders, then I have them go back to wherever it is they're doing their research. So in my case, it's usually Lily because that's what we start using. And so anything that they want to save. So if I open a new tab and um, let's see here, and I will go back to Lily. And so anything that they want to save, I encourage them to do two things. First of all, as they're doing their research, I encourage them to save the URL for any articles that they think they might want. But when you're in a subscription database, it you have to make sure, and I'll just go into Explora, it's probably gonna, for our, for our database, you have to um, put in your, your, your zip code and your city. And so, um, and so, will it work like this? No, it will not. So I'm gonna, let me just, um, let's open something on, um, let's do um, diesel engines, D-I-E-S-E-L. So I show them keywords. So when I type in diesel, I show them how all these different keywords pop up so that they can try and start narrowing their search. We're gonna talk about search terms here in a minute, 
but we're just going to we're just going to open this just uh, as an example. And so when you're in a subscription database, you need to use let me scooch this over. You need to use the tools. So first of all, over here, this is called the permalink. So I can't use this URL in a subscription database, and that is the case for most subscription databases. So I have to use the permalink. This is a really important tool for the kids to learn. So this is the URL that I will copy and then paste into my research notes. So if I even think I want to use this article for research, I want that URL in that research notes, even if they don't make any notes at all. I just want them to have that URL in case they need to go back. Then the other thing I encourage them to do is because we're trying all so hard to go paperless is I try to encourage them to just save a full um, copy of the, if they decide this is the article that I am going to use in my research paper, I want them to save a full copy. There's lots of ways to do this, but this is how I do it is I right click and then I print, which sounds counterintuitive, but when I print, one of my printer options is, let's see more, hopefully it works here. It does in our school district computers. Um, it, one of them is saved to Google Drive. And so we're just moving very slowly and I'm sorry. So one of the printer destination options is saved to Google Drive. And I may, this is such a big file, I may not wait for it to load. But um, down here, save. Okay, so if it's if save to Google Drive is not there, it is on our school district computers. But if it's not, then save a P, save it as a PDF, and or you can save it to OneNote if you're a Microsoft school. But we save it as a PDF and then we upload it back into our drive. My school Google for Education will let me save it straight from my computer straight into my drive. And so that is something that I encourage them to do. So when they're finished and they've done all their research and they're ready to start their paper, they have a file folder that has just all the information they need to write their paper, all their research notes in one place. And so um, when they start where they only need three sources and then they get to their senior project where they need 12 sources, having those organization, organizational skills is key. So I really, teach to that right at the beginning. So, so this is just a screenshot of how, and there's this save to Google Drive. And so, um, and then here, this just tells you how to do it. And then um, if you need to, once you get it into Google Drive, then you move it into your file folder. That way the kids have all of their research in one place. So we go over organization, but we also go over understanding their topic and what questions need to be answered. I think the kids try to rush through this portion and I have several resources here, whoopsie, which um, I will probably not open. Um, most of these are, are um, templates of graphic organizers that your kids are welcome to use. They're from teachers in my school, different teachers teaching research topics and so they shared them with me. There's also a great YouTube video here on um, how to define a research uh, question and how to develop a strong research question. So I found that that if you have the time, I don't have the time to show all these resources, but if you do, I would love for you to show some things. I'm gonna admit Sheila. Um, I would love for you to show the students, some things that are created by other students and other people so that they have a better idea of, of why these things are important. And it's not us just standing here telling them. So the biggest takeaway from this is um, that it takes time. Research takes time. And so they have to think about what are their questions? What do they want to know? And um, what, how can they dial it in? And is it even a, are they gonna be able to find enough information? Sometimes students have a, an idea to do a research paper on something and when they actually start doing the research, there isn't a lot out there. So they may change their focus a little bit. Um, so in this case, often I will encourage them to go out and do a little just basic internet searches on their topics, just to see what's out there, to see what the questions are, to see what the, the um, talk is about that topic. And then um, I also 
encourage them to please go into their research. And this is for young kids, third graders, fourth graders, seventh graders. Don't go into their research project already having made their mind up about what it is that they are going to, to be researching. Or, or if it's an argumentative essay, don't go in already knowing what your opinion is. Use the research to guide your opinion. And this is hard for our kids, again, because there's a lot of family and cultural and social influences on them. So often they have strong opinions, but they haven't actually done the research to back those opinions up. And so I usually try to really make a point of saying, please go into this research project with an open mind and see where the research takes you. So um, that usually leads me into using efficient search strategies. And there are some really good, oopsie, there are some really good uh, uh, resources here. So this keyword, um, I loved this, picking the right search terms. And this is a whole lesson from Google on how algorithms work, which algorithms is if you have high school kids, even if you have middle school or elementary kids, knowing how Google does a search, how the computer system actually does the search or the algorithm, the, the search engine, not the computer, the search engine, how they do the search is super interesting for kids because what it tells them is that it's going to go and use things that they've already sort of looked at and things that it's going to guess what they want to know. So if they have a strong opinion in their, their internet um, practices and their social media um, has taught Google their opinion already, that's what they're going to get more of. They're going to get more results that reinforce what Google thinks they already know. And so using good search terms and using good sources will help them get bias, un, sorry, unbiased and factual information. So this is a great lesson and this shows you what food does Tyson like best and and then uh, think about the words to choose. And so it's actually um, shows you this is a really good process for especially young kids to find keywords, because when you're searching on the internet, using more words can be helpful. But when you're searching in a, in a subscription database, using very succinct keywords is going to get much better results. So I included a link to this presentation in our resources. And then there's also some five must have um, good search tips for students. And this is a little um, better searches, better results. So this is, I thought this was really helpful. This is some, when you're using Google, these are some of the things that you can use to help try. So similar words, the little tilde and excluded words, exact phrases using quotations, defining meanings, searching for specific sites or for specific um, .com and .gov and .edu. You can actually search in the search bar and then just narrow it down so it's only looking at edu sites. And so there are quite a few, and, the, and that um, PowerPoint that I showed you uh, goes through how to do all that. So if we can get our kids to learn how to do this, they can, they can harness the internet for, it'll be so much more efficient for them. Uh, so these are some of the um, some of the resources that I have included, and I know I'm going fast, everyone. I'm really sorry. I'm going to take a breath here and let you process because we're covering a lot of information. But does anybody have questions or anything they want to share? We have about 15 minutes left, and I have a few slides left to cover. But um, I would love to take any inform any questions that anyone has or any comments. Does anybody have anything? You can unmute or you can type in the chat. Everyone's good, just keep going. Awesome, thank you, Kathy, I appreciate that very much. Um, okay, so then uh, I'll keep going then, but if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. 
And so I'm just for, we do have a few people here that are from Idaho. So I included these slides and these slides are in your resources because um, I just want to make sure that our Idaho friends know what you can do in Lily. And so Lily is our database, our, por our database portal with all of our subscription databases. And um, I can't remember if I have already said this, but um, I at ILA, I think, which is our Idaho Library Association Conference, I was in a meeting with several academic librarians. And one of the things that I feel very passionate about is making sure that we send our high school kids off to college with the skills that they need to be able to jump in. And um, awesome. I'm going to, Jeannie, I'm going to read that in a minute. Um, so I want them to be able to get to uh, get to college and be able to jump in and do the academic research. And they said that the kids who come from high schools and middle schools and know how to find their way around an academic, an academic subscription database and who know how to use accurate search terms and who know the difference between um, good, reliable information and maybe information where that you can't, um, that you can't, uh, confirm uh, are so much better off. And they said that often they have to start by teaching those skills. And so they're hoping that we school librarians will be able to get our kids prepared for that. And I know a lot of us do a great job and, and um, a lot of us don't have the time or don't have the access to classes. So hopefully we can keep, keep chipping away at that. And so, um, so there's a couple things I'm going to just stop and read. Uh, Jeannie, Jeannie is our school library consultant for, for, for um, Idaho Commission for Libraries. And she said, just FYI, there is also Lily for Schools at lilyschools.org that streamlines research options. It can be helpful, helpful for novice researchers. That's amazing. And I'm going to be honest, if you haven't downloaded the resources, I'm going to go in and put that in there. And so um, Jeannie, that's Perfect, wonderful information. Thank you so much. And I didn't know about that. So I'm going to start using that. And then also Julia said, there is a great little graphic style book called Information Now, uh, a graphic guide to student research by Epson Hall and Cannon. That is a fun and useful resource. Wonderful. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go buy it. Thank you for sharing that. And Jen said, fabulous info you have shared with us today. Thank you, Jen. You have an amazing day. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. So um, that's wonderful. So the chats, I will be able to send you a list of the chats. Mike, our amazing slim uh, technician that's running this webinar for us, will be able to send me a copy of all the the chat, the, a, a list of the chats that um, we're, we're putting over here. So I can send you all those all those details so that you guys can make sure and have access to that. So, um, so these are a few of my favorite resources in Lilly and we kind of looked at them, but there's Learning Express Library, World Book Advanced. I think that this was um, from, I, use, I, I snagged this out of a previous presentation. So um, things have actually even gotten better. And so, um, uh, and so one of the things that you can do in a um, in a, an academic or a, a, a search, and you can actually do this for the internet also, is um, choose the Lexile level. And so sometimes that's helpful, especially for elementary or maybe middle school students. They can um, they can dial in what the Lexile level is, and usually the Lexile level is actually pretty low. It's the it's just the interest level that can be high. So. Um, and I will happily share those resources with you. Um, and then um, these are the tools that you can use when you're in Explora, which is um, sort of a jumping off point for the, for the uh, um, EBSCO databases. And so I just, um, I included this in the resources for those of you who are from Idaho. So you can take a look at this when you have a few minutes. And, um, and then also easy bib. So we're going to get into um, uh, citing sources. And in Lily, if I go back, you can actually export. And I have a sl I have slides at the end of my presentation that will actually walk you through this for those of you who are in Idaho. But if you use export right here, and you you can export the citation to EasyBib and collect them all in EasyBib, and then 
um, just dump them into either a Microsoft Word file or into a Google Docs file. And our students have loved that. So um, I have outlined that. But citing sources is really important. And I think that um, I've started, if I have the time, I have started uh, explaining to students why citing sources is important, not just telling them you have to do this because that's part of your grade, but why? Why is it important to cite your sources? So this is a little video I found on YouTube that just explains why it's important. Why, if I spend all this time on this presentation and then someone else goes and just takes my little picture off, or maybe you look like me, and adds your name, you know, I, I would at least like credit for it because it, it took a little bit of time. And so that's how the people who post things on the internet and, and academic um, papers. That's what they want. They just want to be given credit for all their hard work. So I found a few things that will help the students understand that. And this little video for elementary schools was um, pretty interesting. And then this, um, this guide for, from Kathy Schrock, I loved this. So Sarah and um, Sheila, my elementary librarians out there that I recognize. Um, this is super interesting. So this is what I had always envisioned for our school district. Um, starting off in grade one, they learn the name of the book and the, or the name of the author and the title of the book. And then when we get to grade two, we add the year the book was published. And there's all kinds of um, examples. Then when we get to year three, we add some of the formatting so that they start to learn that the formatting matters. And then all the way up, and this goes through um, sixth grade. So I thought this was amazing. And this is again on Kathy Schrock's website. And then, um, and then there are also some uh, middle and high school. This is a, a, a LibGuide. You know, I'm gonna be honest. I'm never sure if it's called a LibGuide or a LibGuide, but you know what I'm talking about. And this is from ASU. And this is um, this was a great video on plagiarism that I watched. And it was made by a graduate student. And so I found that this is something interesting. And it just talks about why do you cite your sources and why, um, why it's a really big deal if you don't. Um, not just because your grade's going to go down, but because you're stealing information. And, and in college, it's an almost immediate you're out. So we really work hard on teaching plagiarism at the high school level. And I know we do it in other uh, levels as well. So uh, I've included this as well. And then my good friend, Paul Sutton, for those of you in our school district, you know, Paul, I promised I'd give him credit. Um, this is called MyBib. And this is the, this is the citation machine that we are now using in our school. And we don't necessarily have a citation machine that we make the kids use, but this one is so simple. And so um, when you go into um, my, I have now saved when I'm teaching the students, I just add a citation. I have my projects over here and it's really, really simple. Easy Bib has started asking all the students to watch an ad every so often in order to keep the, the um, resource free and that throws them off and you never know what those ads are gonna be about. And then it just gets a little bit awkward. I've written to EasyBib because I love them and asked if they would ever consider an academic account where if it's a school account, we can skip the ads, but haven't heard back. And so this has been our next go-to and Paul Sutton found this. So um, it's called mybib.com. So I have included that in the resources as well. And so, um, and then of course, owl.purdue.edu. This is just the, the mothership of how to cite your sources. And um, I refer to my MLA handbook. Oh, you can't see it. I refer to that all the time and keep it here. And I let the kids see that I use it as well. Um, I'll just also include that we're very, very, very specific with our students that if you are using a citation machine, it is your responsibility to check that the information is correct. They're not perfect. Even the citations on Lily are not always perfect and the formatting is not always perfect. And so um, while we're trying to make it easier for them to cite their sources so that 
um, they'll be more in the habit of doing it. We also encourage them to be sure that the information is correct and they're giving everybody the, um, the, uh, uh, the reference, the, you know what I'm trying to say. Sorry, I just lost my words. Uh, the credit that they are due. Sorry about that, you guys. So, um, so then at the end of these slides, I have how to export a citation from Lily and import it into EasyBib and then export it to a voila, perfectly cited or perfectly formatted works cited page in either Microsoft Word or Google Docs. And so, um, so I have this at the end of my slides and those are also in the resource page that I have for you. So that is the end of my presentation and it is 11.58, but I am happy to answer any questions that you have. And for my friends from Potlatch, um, I will go back. I should have put it on this slide. I'm gonna go back to slide number one or, or actually slide number two. No, I'm gonna go back to slide number three. Here it is. This is my little Google site um, website and that is where I will post the links to um, anyone who uh, needs to download them. And so right now I have a resource page, so it's not the actual presentation, it's just the resources, but I'm happy to share this PowerPoint or Google slide with you. And so, um, and I think I still have, let me see if I can, I pasted it. No, that's not it. Um, so I will type this into the chat so that you guys can, I copied it once, sites.google.com view Kristen her home. Okay, there you go. So there's the link for that. And I um, am happy to anytime share information with you, just do a Zoom call. I feel like librarians live on an island because we're the only one of us in our schools. And so it's nice to be able to talk to people about what you're doing and how you're doing it. So um, uh, our library, State Library Agency does a lot of little Zoom calls where we can all get together and share ideas, but I'm always happy to be that sounding board person for you. So please feel free to reach out if you have any questions or if there's any way that I can help you. So, and then I'm gonna go back here and say a recording. Um, oh, thank you, Christy, I sure appreciate it. Um, a recording of this presentation and a schedule of upcoming events will be available through the SLIM webinar archive. So there's the link for that. So everybody have an amazing day. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it so much. And just reach out to me if you have any questions and feel free to unmute if you have questions right now. Julia, I'm so glad, thank you. Thanks, Jeannie, you're the best. <laughs> Thanks, thank you. <laughs> All right. We